I'm Shane Morris for the Colson Center. Virtual relationships, excessive screen time, information overload, extended adolescence. These are just a few of the problems plaguing today's teenagers. How do we help them navigate the cultural waters they're swimming in? Today on the Breakpoint Podcast, Warren Cole Smith interviews Mark Gregston, founder and executive director of Heartlight Ministries, a residential counseling facility for adolescents in crisis based in the Piney Woods region of East Texas. Gregston shares his thoughts on leading teens from information, which they have plenty of, to wisdom, on helping parents go from teaching to training, from providing answers to helping their teens ask the right questions. Here are Warren Cole Smith and Mark Gregston. Mark, welcome to the program. You know, I've been wanting to have you on the program for a long time because, you know, because of your expertise with teenagers yeah, today. Yeah. And, um, you know, I guess, and I'm, maybe I shouldn't uh, pollute the well by telling you what I think. Maybe I should just ask <laughs> you what you think. But it seems to me that the American teenager is in something of a crisis right now. And I'm just wondering if that's oh, what yeah. you think. Yeah, you know, I, I do think they are. And, and here's the reason why. Kids have been the same in one sense for since the beginning of time. They want the same things. They long for the same things. It's just ex- it's just that so many other things have been accelerated that what it's done with any teen today is that where people usually get their value and their self esteem and have a release of of anxiety and depression and all is in relationships with one another. And our kids do not have the relationships that you and I used to have. I mean, even that they don't have the relationships, you know, that, that five years ago were somewhat normal. Our kids today are spending so much time looking at a screen that the issue isn't the screen. The issue is the opportunity cost that goes along with that, that just basically says, I'm spending time looking at something, but I'm not spending time engaging with one another. And God created every one of us to be relational. And if he did that, and we don't have those relational needs met, that's when kids start doing stupid stuff and and pulling stunts and getting somewhat crazy, you know, trying to figure out how do I get my value? How do I get those things that a relationship provided that they're just not getting? You know, I do, though, when I ask, I mean, clearly the screen issue is a relatively recent phenomenon. You know, the uh, iPhone, I think, came out in 2007. So that's, you know, within the last dozen years or so. And, you know, there's been a lot of new things in technology. But I can, you know, think back to, you know, 50 or 60 years ago where we had Rebel Without a Cause movies from the 1950s. The the idea that adolescence is kind of a new thing, that, uh, you know, you go back 100 years, you, you worked on the farm side by side with your parents. And then the day came whenever it was time for you to assume the responsibilities of adulthood. There was, there was no quote, you know, teenage years or adolescence to speak of. So some things are the same. Some things are are different. Technology and screens are nearly clearly a new thing. Um, Has anything else changed? I mean, what's causing all of this? Well, you know what? I I think it's uh, that sense that things have become very permissive. They've been promoted and, uh, and kids begin to think, I have a, a ton of opportunity out there to use my, if you will, curiosity to figure out some things. Now everything, they can do anything they want. But I think the bigger issue, and I, I, you know, I, I believe this to be true, is that, is that there is so much information that is given to kids. When you and I grew up, information doubled in this world every 13 years. Codified information that had just doubled. 13 years. If you grew up in the 30s, it was every 30 years. You grew up at the turn of the century, 1900. It was 100 years. Currently, information is doubling every hour and a half. Wow. Next year will be instantaneous. And what that does, it just means that kids get bombarded with so much information. An example of that would be when I grew up, there were three TV channels. Really two, and if you had rabbit ears with aluminum foil on it, you can see the third one. Okay, I've got 900 now. Yeah. I used to have just a couple of places to get music. Now I've got hundreds of places to get music. I've got websites, the Internet. There's so much information, news sources. So our kids get bombarded with those things, and there is so much of it that it is just absolutely amazing. So I tell parents all this all the time. If you're just a source of information, your kids are going to cut you off in a heartbeat because they don't need any more information because they've got Siri. They've, they've got access to anything they want. My concern for kids is that they're now interpreting Scripture as just another piece of information. And if they are, what that means is I don't need to share it as information. I now need to move out of a teaching model into a training model where I'm engaging differently 
to show the example, to, to, to say, here is a living display of, of the Word becoming flesh and dwelling among you. You can see the impact. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks in such a way that somebody goes, okay, I, I'm not only hearing about it, because like all this information, I am now seeing it before me. And I think that's what kids desperately need. But they're not because those people that are in authority around them have been so trashed the way we hear information. When you think about, you know, when I think about who was influential in my life, you know, the pastor of a church or a coach or, you know, and now you, what's the first thing that kids think of when they hear the word coach, you know, in some places of the country or teachers? The places, they think of a sexual predator in they, some cases. They really do. Yeah. I mean, they, they get this idea that everybody's like that. Well, it's not, but there's so much information out there that they are hardly trusting anybody, and that feeds this lack of relationship. Yeah. So it's this kind of a cyclical thing that's happening, but our kids are paying the price, so they're not maturing. The American Medical Association has increased the age of adolescence, stage 27. American Journal of Adolescent Psychiatry has increased it to age 26. And I go, it's all because they're not relating with one another and have the depth of relationships of iron sharpening iron. Mm. And so I think that's one of the challenges. Well, that information overload, to me, kind of feels like there, there's at least two layers of that. And maybe from where you sit mm. in your expertise, you might even think of many more. But not only is it that there's so much information that information is devalued so that if we as parents come to our kids with information, as you say, they shut us out. It's like, we don't yeah, need yeah, any more yeah, information. Yeah. Got all the information I need. But number two, I also wonder about the underdeveloped mind and heart and spirit that has to deal with information, not only in a quantity, but of a quality that we never had to deal with whenever we were kids as well. Yeah. They turn on the television. They don't even have to turn on the television. They just have to walk down the street yeah. and look at the LC, L, you know, the LED panels on yeah, the yeah, sides yeah. of buildings yeah. with, that are you know, ticker tape with sexual crimes and yeah. Uh, yeah. tragedies all around the world, yeah. and they're nine years old. You can't shield your kids from that, and yet they don't really have the intellectual, emotional, and spiritual tools yet developed to process that and put that in categories. Right, right. Yeah. And I think what happens is they become numb to it then. I will never give permission for anybody to say, yeah, pornography is great. I'm not saying that. But our kids see pornography that it doesn't even bother them anymore. They don't blush. They're exposed to so many things. They see death and it's not that big of a deal. I mean, they've been so overwhelmed that it's numbing who they are. But what it does also, it screams for the need for a place of wisdom, for our kids to get wisdom. And when parents continue to give their child something they already have too much of, they get sick of it. It provokes them to wrath, if you will. It's like that scripture that says, you know, what father, when his son asks for a fish, gives him a serpent. When he asks for bread, gives him a stone. What, well, what father, when his son asks for wisdom, gives him more information? And I'm not adding to Scripture. I know what happens to those people. I'm just saying that kids are wanting that, and parents have got to make that shift to say, I'm going to engage differently at 11 or 12 years old. Now, now here's the thing. Here's an example of it. I think that we can all survive without cell phones. Humankind has lasted a long time without a cell phone. But now that's how kids uh, engage with one another. It's how they ask and invite people to be involved. It's a part of their life. I tell people all the time, give your child a cell phone at eight or nine years old. And people say, you're crazy. And I go, you know what? I don't believe they need it, but their culture has shifted, which means I need to shift. And so I need to accommodate that which I don't even think is right in one sense so that I can train a child to start using a phone so that it doesn't consume them. They're still listening to you at eight and nine years old. They're not listening to you at 12 and 13 anymore. And so it means I adjust my expectations and what I'm doing to accommodate the needs of a child. I can either raise my child to live in a zoo or I can prepare them to survive in the jungle. And so I, if I'm doing that, that means I've got to kind of change some of my thoughts about how do I get my child to a place where they can survive. Now, I don't like that idea. I don't like the idea of kids getting phones because I don't think it's needed. But on the other hand, 
it is preparing them for the world that they're going to live in. And if that's true, then I want to have a voice to be able to speak wisdom and truth into their life as they process and learn how to engage. And that's just an example. I think we need to do it in a number of other ways just to prepare our kids for this crazy culture that you and I have said that we're glad that we don't have to grow up in. Well, I think a lot of people listening are going to find that to be a pretty shocking idea. To oh, give I know. To, you know. Because you got a lot of Christian folks that are saying, don't give cell oh, yeah. phones to your kids until they're 14, 15, or 16 years old. Yeah. And you're saying just the opposite of well, that. Well, I'm saying give it to them, but I mean, control everything. I mean, if you had a child that's eight, nine years old, I would look at everything constantly. I would say, you get to talk to four people. You know, now when they get to be nine or 10, maybe it's 15 people and you enlarge those circles. But what I'm doing is training them to handle that which they've been given or will have access to. It doesn't mean that they have to have all the apps. So they, they don't have to have access everywhere, but I control it. Now, then at some point, I'm not going to control it as much because hopefully they have developed responsibility and know how to not have a cell phone consume them like you see in every airport, everywhere, where people are just looking at phones all the time. I mean, we're consumed, and it's getting in the way of relationships, which means we're going to try to have those relational needs met in other ways, and you can't do that. Shane Morris with you again, and I hope you're enjoying today's Breakpoint podcast. We couldn't keep these podcast episodes coming to you without the generous support of donors like you. If you're a regular donor to the Colson Center, I want to take this opportunity to say thank you. If you're not, there's no better time than now as we near the end of our fiscal year on June 30th. To become a financial supporter of the Colson Center, just go to breakpoint.org and hit the Give button at the top of the page. Thanks very much, and enjoy the rest of this Breakpoint podcast episode. So if the part of the answer here is to move away from pouring information out and trying to make sure that our kids have true wisdom and taking them from a place of pseudo relationships and isolation uh, that they maybe get a sense of in this digital world to a place of true relationships. If that's part of the pathology and part of the solution, what do you tell parents and kids? I know you deal with a lot. That's primarily your ministry, right? I mean, on the radio, you do that, but you also have a a ministry where you're working directly with them as well. Yeah. I live with 60 high school kids. I mean, and so everything I talk about, it's got to be practical and it's got to work or or I'd have a mutiny back at our our place called Heartlight in Longview, Texas. I mean, and so, I, I mean, the kids that live with us are no different than anybody who's listening, their kids. I mean, it's, and so it's and, got to be practical to engage. Well, let me pause you there because, as you said, you live with 60 people in Texas that you're, you're resident of. Yeah. Are, are these kids that have gotten into trouble in some way or troubled yeah. in some way? Um, well, what, why do kids come to you? Yeah. And where do you take them from and where are you trying to take them to? All right, the kids that come to us are spinning out of control. Half of them would say if they wouldn't come live with us, they'd be dead. They come from great homes, great backgrounds. They know scripture like the back of their hand. But somewhere, something has, has gotten out of hand. Somebody was murdered in their family, the World Trade Center, the space shuttle goes down. And, and so we have kids that are from that. Any shooting that you hear of in this country, we get the brothers and sisters that come and live with us. They've been through trauma and difficulty, hardship, rape, sexual abuse, you know, maybe eating disorders, maybe a little bit of drug stuff. They're anxious. They, they are depressed. They're suicidal. I mean, these kids are struggling and parents are going, we don't know what to do, but they know that if they don't do something, this child's not going to be around. I'm a little fearful for our 15 year old kids. 15-year-old girl suicide rate is at a 75-year high. 15-year-old boys, it is the second highest grouping for suicides next to our veterans. And so there's a part of it where I go, our kids are, are struggling in a culture, and we have a tendency to say, then let's give them more information to help them through it. And I'm going... That's not what they want, and it's not what they need, because their world is already filled with information. So what we do is help kids process things, give them wisdom. How do I get through this? How do I work to the other side? And it it just means that parents can do that at home as well, meaning this. A daughter comes and says, Mom, is it okay to have sex? And the, a mom goes, no, no, don't have sex. Scripture says don't have sex. 
Well, if kids are interpreting that as just another piece of information, they're going to let it go. What you need to share with them is a sense of wisdom. And that wisdom would be, hun, I want you to know this, that having sex before marriage, there's a reason it's mentioned in Scripture. But having sex, it confuses relationships. And, and if this is the guy you want to marry, now doesn't that sound a little bit different than just saying don't do it? Hey, Dad, did you smoke pot in high school? It may be saying, no, don't smoke pot. That's not the issue. The bigger issue is, when you share that wisdom is saying the kids that I see that smoke pot, they lose their motivation. They don't have a drive. They don't reach their goals and they become dependent on something they shouldn't be. That's why I don't want you smoking it. Mm. It's saying, take it from just an information place and move it to an opportunity to share wisdom, which is truly the biblical values that we pour out, that we gather wisdom by what we see, observation, what we think about, and what we experience. And we share that with kids, not just more information. Yeah. Well, Mark, that's really good advice. But I, I want to push gently back on that a little bit and see, get mm-hmm. your response. Because I've raised four kids, and my yeah, wife yeah. and I have raised four kids. So they're mostly adults now. They're My youngest is 19 <laughs> years old. And, you know, and I can. Um, my experience, and I've, I've got great kids. I, yeah, yeah. I sometimes say that uh, God gave me good kids because I'm not smart enough to raise bad kids. And um, <laughs> But even in spite of that, my experience has been that I may not be the first person that they come to with those questions right. that you're talking right. about. Uh, they may, in fact, never come to me with some of those questions, like, Dad, should I smoke pot? Or, Dad, should I, you know, have sex before marriage? Yeah, yeah. You know, the, um, how do I initiate those conversations? That's a good question. And, and Because that's what I want. Because there aren't too many people out there that are engaging with your child to provide that sense of wisdom, nor do they have the experience that you do, nor the connection. And so what I want to do is create the atmosphere where they can ask questions. I mean, during the first 12 years of their life, I think we give a lot of answers. The next 12 years of their life, we need to be sharing a lot of questions that we're cultivating what they've learned to help bring that about. And as I ask them questions, it's the the hope that they will come back and start asking me questions as I have a better relationship with them that they'll long to move toward me. As I start sharing my imperfections, which is important. I mean, it's good to be perfect the first 12 years because a teaching model demands perfection, just like it demands lecture. But you get up in a training model, lecture doesn't work anymore. It's more about discussion. And it's also about relationship of the imperfection. I want my kids to know it's okay to be imperfect, that really this side of heaven, you're not going to be fixed. And it's okay to struggle through some things like we all do rather than having all the answers. I want to have all the answers ages 1 through 12. I want to have all the questions that promotes them and pushes them to start asking hard questions of life and figuring out without me just giving them the answer all the time. Mm. And so I'm creating an atmosphere for that to happen. It's loving my kids and saying saying that a gentle message to them that says, there's nothing you can do to make me love you more. There's nothing you can do to make me love you less. And when a child begins to see that and sees my vulnerability and my genuineness and my desire to be authentic, that I wrestle with how to flesh out the gospel in a culture that's ever-changing, even though I know it's timeless truth, I'm still trying to figure it out. It gives them permission to do so, so that now I can become somebody who's walking alongside them rather than some Somebody who always is confronting them and worried about, you know, following the rules and consequences and such. Mark, uh, one of the things that you've impressed upon me and our listeners um, during this conversation is the idea of moving beyond a teaching model to a training model. Yeah. And I think, and I don't want to beat up on families, I don't want to beat up on the church, <laughs> but I think implicit in that yeah. model is that maybe we've been focused too much on the teaching yep. uh, and not enough on the training. So let me just ask you directly, um, if there's one thing that our parents and our churches could do should start doing, what would it be? And if there's one thing we should stop doing, yeah. what would that be? You know what? I made this comment the other day. I was speaking at a at an event, and I said, I've got this idea for a new book. I think I would title it, Shut Your Pie Hole and Learn to Listen. And I think what's happening is, and that it grabs your attention by saying that, but yet there's a part of it, if we would just stop Stop talking all the time. Scripture says that even a fool appears wise when he keeps his mouth shut, that a fool uh, delights in sharing his opinion, that our kids 
have been listening to us for 12 and 13 years. Now it's our time to listen to them and to hear their heartbeat and where they're struggling. And if we could learn how to listen to what they're saying, because there's nobody listening to anybody anymore. It's everybody just yapping all the time. It's everybody on the Internet, social media, Snapchat, pictures here, pictures there, comments. Everybody's expressing themselves all the time. It's all about me, me, me. And what they're looking for is is a way to go, okay, how do I engage differently here? How do I, where it's not just about me. And I think if we listen to kids, then we can sit down and start having dialogue and discussion and, and walk with them in their struggles. So I would definitely say it's listening because I don't think anybody's listening to our teens anymore. As a result, you look at any church in this country, the middle of the sophomore year, that's when kids start to leave. 84% of kids are leaving the church upon graduation from high school. They take a hiatus for the next 10 years. Then they come back when they start having their own kids. I think we as a whole are doing a poor job of engaging kids during their last two years of high school because we see them leaving and giving up. And it's because we think, well, the stuff that we did in middle school and in ninth and 10th, it's going to work. It doesn't work anymore. And you can just look at the numbers and see it. And so I think the smart youth pastor, the smart teacher says, let's do it differently. And a big component of that is learning to listen to the heartbeat of a child. Mark, I want to pivot in our conversation and ask you about a couple of specifics um, that um, I'm just wondering if you've got some uh, some word for us because of items that have been in the news. Mm-hmm. Um, there have been um, the Parkland shootings down in uh, Florida of, um, I guess, about a year ago. I spoke there a week before that. You yeah. did? You spoke at that school a week before? No, I spoke at a church that was a half mile from there the week wow. before that. Well, then you maybe you've thought about this um, um, deeply over the last uh, mm-hmm. year or so. One of the terrible consequences of that shooting was not only the kids that died then, but there have been a couple of suicides yeah. recently. Yeah. The Sandy Hook shooting uh, where all those little children were killed recently, one of the dads committed suicide. Yeah. Um, just despair, isolation, loneliness, survivor guilt, all kinds of uh, probably contributing factors to those suicides. And I'm not going to, I don't know, can't right, speak right. definitively to right. what caused these folks, but, but suicide is on the rise in this country. Yeah. Uh, despair and depression is on the rise in this country. If we've got friends, if we've got family members that are struggling with these issues, what's your word for them? Well, you know, I, I think it's your presence in their life. I think what happens, because we have we have kids from those two settings that you're talking about, everybody jumps up and the first thing is gun control. And I'm going, you know what the first thing ought to be is, how do I listen to these people that are struggling and walk alongside them. Not just be so concerned about the the yapping that goes on, all the things we need to change and how miserable. We forget about the victims in this thing, that that we need to walk alongside them. We need to spend time with them and engage with them and, and just show up at times. Not We don't always have to have a cause that comes out of any tragedy. What we need to have is a, I think is a purpose of engaging with people. I I mean, the kids that I know, I know 40 kids have committed suicide. What happened is they've ended up becoming very lonely, and they don't feel like they have anybody around them. They don't feel like they're worthy. And And the more we see relationships become shallower and shallower among our adolescents, we're going to see the suicide rates continue to increase. I think what happens is we make some of these tragedies into these spectacles of uh, or a platform for something else and in the midst of it we're missing mm. the heart of the victims because somebody feels like I'm it's hopeless because nobody's listening to me nobody understands me they're not engaging with me I think that's where we've got to engage differently with people that are caught in tragedy like that well you know Mark I don't want to be glib about this but you know what Woody Allen once said that 80 percent of success in life is just showing up yeah and it sounds like that maybe a little bit more seriously and not as you know not as glibly as that that's what you're recommending that we just need yeah. to show up not not as face Facebook friends, but as real friends in other people's lives. Uh, you know, what's crazy about it, people have called me the teen whisperer, which I think is kind of weird. Um, I don't know where that comes from, because when I sit down with kids, I listen. And so they think I have this magic power. If you just listen, 
if you just stop and quit thinking about your program and what you want to get across, like it's it's just it's getting with people and just engaging with them. And that's your presence. Your presence means more than any words you can say. We get stuck in this mindset. Words is all about a teaching model. Actions are, is what expresses something to people that is far beyond our words. And I think if we would engage differently, then I, then I think we would see a difference in these kids. Because kids are now looking at, at suicide as a coping mechanism, that it's just a thought, okay, I can do that. I tell you, I've been around it. I've known kids that I've talked to one day and they're dead the next day. And it is weird and odd, but it's different. It's not just mental illness anymore. It is that they believe that's the only way out because they don't have anybody relationally helping them along and going, hey, you could do this. We can get through this together. And I think that's, I I think kids are screaming for that. Thanks again for listening to the Breakpoint Podcast. Come to breakpoint.org Click on this podcast and we'll link you to Mark Gregston's popular radio program, Parenting Today's Teens. And again, we'd so much appreciate your financial support for the Breakpoint Podcast and the Colson Center. Just come to breakpoint.org and click on Give at the top of the page. Thanks so much. Warren Cole Smith originally conducted this interview with Mark Gregston for Listening In, a weekly program of World News Group. To learn more about Listening In, go to wng.org slash listening in. For the Colson Center, I'm Shane Morris.